Good afternoon, everybody. I am David Theo Goldberg, the director of the University of California Humanities Research Institute. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the second in our series on Boiling Point, this one on movement uh, we make. Uh, it, I want to begin just by thanking our panelists uh, who will be introduced in uh, due course uh, and to thank all our staff in helping us to get to this point uh, as well as all of you out there who we can't see uh, but we know are out there uh, for joining us for what should be a really uh, exhilarating and scintillating conversation. I want to begin just by making uh, an announcement. Uh, we uh, announced last night actually that uh, Patrice Cullors has been subjected to some really debilitating um, racist uh, expression uh, coming out of central Arizona where she holds a, um, a faculty position at a college, uh, including a death threat and she's been advised to step back as a consequence from making any public appearances for the moment. So unfortunately she will not be able to join us, uh, but we stand in solidarity with her and hopefully in the future we will be able to re-engage. Talking of solidarity, uh, we have also been uh, engaged with the students who are striking at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and they've given us, uh, they've known as the COLA students, they've given us a statement which we're happy to read in their behalf. Uh, strikers and protesters involved in the Wildcat strike for a cost of living adjustment at UC Santa Cruz and other campuses this academic year have experienced extraordinary repression for demanding a living wage. More than 80 graduate students were fired. 41 graduate students remain ineligible for work in the fall. In February, the Santa Cruz administration spent $300,000 a day, totaling about $6 million in total to activate police, what they call mutual aid networks. The UC Santa Cruz Police Department was reinforced by other UC police departments, city, county, state, and National Guard. They used military surveillance equipment to monitor the activities of students and deployed police in full riot gear who beat undergraduate and graduate students with batons. Some still suffer from their injuries. In the months since the February picket line, the same UC PD officers who brutalized students have been deployed alongside city and county police forces to brutalize protesters in the streets of Oakland, reciprocating the police mutual, mutual aid from which they benefited only a few weeks earlier. The national debate about defunding and redesigning policing is necessarily the University of California's too. Most recently, statements from these police officers have been uh, used as evidentiary foundation of discipline through the campus student code of conduct. This discipline takes the form of student suspensions for up to two years, overwhelmingly targeting undocumented students and students of color. UCPD as the backbone of disciplinary proceedings meant to maintain order among students and workers is a structuring element of the university as a whole. We decry the violence of UCPD and all police on our campus and in the streets of our cities. The University of California, uh, it, the statement goes on, must defund, disarm and dismantle all UC police departments. It must also end all military spending, development of war resources and imperializing investments and practices. Uh, I've been saying for some time that the University of California is a learning and educational institution, not a policing institution, and it should behave accordingly. Um, finally, all five graduate students must be reinstated and there must be no further retaliation against all involved in the strike. To learn more, you can go to payusmoreucse.com uh, where there's lots of material and literature and you'll be able also uh, to contribute to their support uh, from that site. I want now to turn to introducing Avery Gordon, our moderator uh, for this afternoon um, and evening for some of you. 
Uh, Avery is Professor Emerita of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and visiting professor at Birkbeck School of Law, the University of London. She is the author of the Hawthorne Archive, Letters from the Utop Utopian Margins, most recently in 2018, The Workhouse, The Bretonau Room, uh, again, this co authored in 2015, the terrifically and justifiably well known Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination, which was reprinted, uh, re, re, re edited, and, and um, uh, in 2008, Keeping Good Time, Reflections on Knowledge, Power, and People in 2004, and Mapping Multiculturalism in 1997, among much else that she's produced. Her work focuses on radical thought and practice, and she writes about captivity, enslavement, war, and other forms of dispossession, and how to eliminate them. She serves on the edit editorial committee of the really long-standing, important journal called Race and Class, and has been the co-host of No Alibis, a weekly public affairs radio program on KCSB FM Santa Barbara for the last 23 years. She is a former keeper of the Hawthorne Archive. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Avery to introduce the others and to moderate this discussion. I'm sure we're all looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much. And also for inviting me to moderate the second of these conversations, Race at the Boiling Point. I'm very happy to to be here and I'd also like to thank the HRI staff for their professionalism in organizing the event. There's all kinds of stuff going on in the background you all can't see um, and to also acknowledge the sign interpreters for their work translating today and of course thank you all for for being here in this form. So the format today is that I'm, I will now kind of formally introduce the, the panelists and get us started with, with some questions. After about 40, 45 minutes, we will take your questions or the speakers will take your questions and the staff would appreciate if you could send them the questions within the first 40 minutes or so, they'll collate them and, and pass them and pass them on. Um, so I think that, um, uh, yeah, that's the, the only business matters in the beginning. So let me introduce our wonderful panelists. I'll begin with, we're gonna just go alphabetically here. So I'll begin with Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who is a professor of earth and environmental sciences and the director of the Center for Place, Culture and Politics at the Cooney Graduate Center. She's the author of the award-winning book, Golden Gulag, Prison Surplus, Crisis and Opposition in Globalizing California, and Change Everything, Racial Capitalism in the Case for Abolition, which is forthcoming from Haymarket Books in February. Ruthie is a longtime prison abolitionist and one of the co-founders of the California Prison Moratorium Project and Critical Resistance. Abdul Malik Simon is professorial fellow at the Urban Institute, University of Sheffield, and honorary professor at the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. He's the author of several books about urbanism in Africa and South and Southeast Asia, including For the City Yet to Come, Urban Life in Four African Cities, and most recently, Improvising Lives rhythms of endurance in an urban south. And for many years, he has been working closely with young people in large urban centers on political organization and modes of survivability. And last but not least, we have Rafif Ziada, who is a Palestinian activist, scholar, and poet, currently based in London. Rafif is an assistant professor in the politics department at SOAS, University of London, where she does research on the political economy of war and humanitarianism, racism and the security state. You can find her most, one of her most recent articles, an antipode. And she has a new book coming out from Verso this month, 
Revolutionary Feminisms, Conversations on Collective Action and Radical Thought, that's edited with Brenna Bondar. Rafif has been an organizer with a number of grassroots Palestinian refugee rights and anti-poverty campaigns. So welcome to you all for this conversation. Okay, so let's now move into getting, getting started talking with each other. These UC HRI conversations, as I'm presuming most of the watchers, viewers, listeners know, are responding to the general uprising that followed the police killing of George Floyd that has brought the problem of policing state violence and anti-Black racism to the forefront of popular attention, both in the US and elsewhere. We could think of this as a kind of third wave of the movement for Black Lives following on from the uprisings after the 2012 murder of Trayvon Martin and those in Ferguson in 2014 after Michael Brown's killing. And this wave has been bigger, broader, and able to build on the kind of evolving vision and often invisible hard work of organizers who keep busy between the waves of, of mainstream media attention. For those of you who watched the first conversation, you might recall that their opening question was about how to understand and articulate the current moment or the current conjuncture. And their answers, though, moved very quickly to an analysis of the ongoing activist movements that are now as I say, much more visible, but have been going on in the background, and also the new mobilizations that have more recently kind of arisen. And today we're starting with movement, but I feel pretty confident uh, that the answers are also going to contribute to deepening our understanding of the conjuncture in which we're, we're living. The, the invitation to the conversation today um, by David has invited us into the word movement as it crisscrosses several meanings, including collective mobilization, social movements, organized and disorganized, and also what Asaf Bayat calls the quiet encroachment of non-movement movements. There's also the movement of ideas, the movement of public monuments, you know, like off their pedestals, the movement of the limits of what's tolerable, intolerable, and of course, the continuing movement of people escaping war and homes that they can no longer live in. This movement, of course, comes in response to, against, and up against various forms of immobilization and confinement, some temporary, some permanent, is coming in response to really the the recognition more broadly now of the general constriction of what life could and, and should be. So I think given these amazing, wonderful participants we have for the conversation today, that we can expect that it's going to keep open the capacious meaning of the term in the, in the spirit of David's invitation while giving it the, the kind of specificity that we need and that each of the speakers can, can bring to it. And that's really where I'd like to, to start and begin, and that is by asking each of you if you would lay down the first track, so to speak, by saying what movement as a kind of keyword means to you in this moment of widespread anti-racist ferment. In other words, what you think is at stake from the vantage of your considerable knowledge, experience, and from the vantage of your political standpoint. And I'd like to start with Ruthie, and then maybe um, Rafif and uh, Malik will come in. So Ruthie, please. Okay, good uh, afternoon, good evening, everybody. Good early tomorrow morning, somewhere <laughs> probably on the planet. It's very good to be here and to be back in the UCHRI fold where David and Avery and I spent three very intense months 20 years ago, um, thinking about a lot of the things that we're going to talk about right now. Um, I would like to start with a story, as I want to do. Um, 
And it's going to seem a little peculiar, but I think it will become evident why I tell this story. So a little more than 20 years ago, I worked sometimes as a paralegal. And I would go with an activist legal non-for-profit firm into California's security housing units to interview prisoners about their conditions of confinement. And the entire purpose of this formation was to end and close security housing units completely. Because we were a not ideological uh, formation under the laws of the state of California, we could not pick and choose the people in the security housing unit we spoke with. We had to put out a blanket offer to interview anyone who responded and interview every single prisoner who said, yes, I want to talk to you. So one day, a group of us drove to Pelican Bay State Prison, which is in the northwest corner of California, uh, just outside this uh, town called Crescent City. And the way we divided the work up was that we would have a box of files for every single uh, prisoner who had asked to speak to us. And we would just take turns pulling the next folder and go talk to the next prisoner. And uh, the supervising attorney at the time was like me, somebody with quite aging, quite long dreadlocks. So I pulled my next fo folder late in the afternoon and found that I had drawn the case of a person who was part of the Aryan Brotherhood, a very well-known, uh, notorious white supremacist prison gang. So I went to talk to him. And for those of you who have never been inside a prison in a prison, I assure you there's nothing but layers of bulletproof plexiglass, although there are no bullets inside, uh, that separate uh, people who are being held against their will from people who have come to offer them legal and other advice. I walked in and the guy I was going to talk to was already on the other side. And we each picked up our phones to talk because of course we couldn't speak to each other or hear each other through two layers of bulletproof glass. And he said, when they brought me in, I peered out into the waiting room and I could see you and that other guy with dreadlocks. And do you know what I thought? I thought the revolution had happened and you were Mumia and Angela and you had come to rescue us. So I start with that story not because it's a miracle, but rather because it's such a compressed story of what I think is happening now in terms of consciousness. It's not consciousness opening uh, necessarily in such a way that people who have always hated people of color suddenly do not, but rather consciousness cracking open so that people who feel rightly confined and abandoned can see things they couldn't see before, based in something that is at least a little bit familiar. And in this case, it was this person imagining that someone who looked like me and the supervising attorney must be Mumia and Angela. This, I think, is, underlies a good deal of the movement that I have been learning about over the past several months, especially since the police in, uh, in Minneapolis killed so brutally George Floyd. There are people moving in the streets. There are concepts that are articulating struggles in new ways that are very rough, but give us something to work with. There are people who are using already existing activities that are becoming new for them because they are experiencing the activity in a new context. And what gives me the greatest hope and anxiety is how quickly this, these waves 
of restlessness are sweeping around the planet and lifting people up and out in such a way that many different kinds of theories might lead this restlessness into many kinds of directions. And what I am most hopefully hopeful for is something that is green and red and internationalist, which is to say abolition at heart. So that for me is what movement means right now. And I'll be happy to discuss with my co-panelists and the audience uh, some of the various uh, instantiations of that movement that I've encountered here in Europe, where I've been for a while, talking with my colleagues in Brazil, talking with comrades in South Africa and elsewhere around the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Rafif, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you, Ruthie, so much. And thank you, UC uh, HRI, for having us and having this conversation. I know it was a little bit like herding cats to get us all on one date together. So it's, it's a pleasure. And thanks to everyone who's watching or will watch later. Um, when it comes to movement, the first word that comes to mind for me is intifada, uh, the Arabic word for uprising. Not only does it mean uprising, it also means a shaking off. And I think that combination of a people rising together to build something and shaking off the old um, is really the moment that we are seeing right now. As Ruthie already said, um, rough ideas come about in these flashes, but it does open up the space for radical ideas. I think in the past few decades, we've seen lots of ebbs that happen. Um, but the assault on the standard of living on our way of living has, has also been an assault on our radical imaginary, what we could possibly put forward um, as, as things that would be acceptable. Um, in the case of Palestine, we were often told, don't frame it as settler colonialism, just speak about occupation, for example. Um, in the case of abolition, it's often just speak about reformism, don't bring up abolition right now. So this space is really opening up our radical imaginaries to be able to say and state things um, that wouldn't have been common just a few weeks ago. On the other hand, quite often when people speak about the Intifada, the Palestinian one in particular of 87, they call it a spontaneous um, event. And it's true, the spark was spontaneous as they usually are. But the work that sustains such an uprising, the work that sustains such a movement is actually very long term, deliberate movement building um, that asks people questions about what they need, uh, what they're hoping for, and imagines things that are quite radically different. Um, so Soci Canadian sociologist Alan Sears uh, talks about an infrastructure of dissent that what, what we speak about when we speak of movements is not simple flashes of moments but all of the infrastructures that allow us to imagine and work together. Um, and this would include, of course, not just the long meetings <laughs> that many of us attend on a weekly basis, but also the, the places of leisure and pleasure, um, the, the pubs and the poetry and the discussions that we have are also part of that infrastructure of building and imagining something different. Holding that building while also always questioning um, the structures of power, never forgetting to question and analyze those issues of power. And finally, I would say this, this moment and, and movement for me is really inspiring because of the way that it travels. In a lot of the ebbs that we have seen, um, almost like fire, they jump from one place to the next. Now, this doesn't mean that our movements are identical or that the situations we all face are identical but that there is a structure that more and more people are starting to see and, and analyze. Um, and here, I would say it's very useful for us to go beyond the analysis of, of analogies. There's oppression here and oppression there. There's police here and police there, but actually deepen our thinking around how these structures of oppression work, how coercive measures travel from one state to the next, how they apply, whether it's policing or militarism, uh, to think about it more deeply beyond analogy into analysis of these structures so we can all have the capacity to combat them better and differently in each of the situations that we face. 
Thanks, Rafif. Malik? Yes, thank you also, uh, HRI, for the, the conversation, for the opportunity. Um, it's difficult to generalize from a multiplicity of movements that are operative within the large urban regions of the southern latitudes, which I work, focus on, engage. But I want to perhaps point to one thing, which is increasingly that that movement itself becomes a mode of a critical mode of, of urban inhabitation. And, and not movement as going from A to B, uh, not getting away or catching up, uh, but movement as a continuous process of living the urban condition. Um, I mean, we, we, we witnessed in, in India the way in which um, many workers in the large urban areas simply walked away from the city uh, with large treks to their, to their homes in, in other regions. But I also want to point to a kind of walking away that is taking place on the part of increasing number of residents from the kinds of compliance of a certain kind of self-fashioning, uh, walking away from the expectation, the anticipation of consolidating a standpoint, of consolidating a position in place, of investing in being known and addressed and represented by where one is located within an urban region. And this kind of continuous movement has implications for the ways in which social reproduction takes place, the ways in which basic living arrangements and households are formed, and prefigures a kind of sensibility and an, an incipient form of political demand and mobilization that is not easily recognizable and not clear exactly how it will, it will take place. This doesn't obviate at all that for many that are stuck in place, uh, whose mobilities are constrained, it doesn't obviate the fact that across many districts, particular forms of reciprocity, mutual organization, self-organization, auto-construction, political mobilization, demand is, not, is, is taking place. It is. But across the, these urban regions, one increasingly sees the, this sense of people abandoning the anticipation and the objective of consolidating a position for themselves in place. And this is an entirely different kind of orientation to inhabitation that I think we don't know exactly where it will, where it will lead, but it's something that, that I think has major stakes in terms of how we think about uh, urban inhabitation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Um, actually, let's, um, I'd like to just pick up where you left off, because part of what you're describing as everyday life in African and South and Southeast Asian context, more or less third world cities, has come to the first world in a different way. Certainly, one of the notable features of a good deal of the activism in the United States now, kind of built up over the past 10 years, coming from different sources, is the extent to which people are trying to create 
autonomously, collectively, sort of what they need to survive and thrive, while in many cases still struggling for change at the state level. So, you know, whether we're talking about alter small things, alternatives to calling 911, sanctuary housing, community defenders, new forms of horizontal queer leadership, transformative justice systems, cooperative, nonprofit, non-indebted local economies, the re-emergence of mutual aid, non-university-based research and study, dot, 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 dot. There's a lot of exciting kind of energy and resilience really for um, making social struggles and social movement a part of you know, an experimental and change-oriented everyday life exactly in context of abandonment in that sense. At the same time, I think these projects raise very difficult and complicated questions about the state, about infrastructure, building it, appropriating it, scale, about the local and the global. And I um, am sort of hoping that you all would um, sort of address this kind of as you as you see fit and I think it's helpful to hear maybe continue to stay a little bit outside of the US to to begin um, um, and maybe we I would turn to Rafif because she has done a lot of research on the logistics and the infrastructures that kind of link business war humanitarian assistance and that these new new let's say or newer newly emerging infrastructures of kind of non-capitalist care in the US or um, the kinds of um, hive of activity that um, Malik is talking about that these are facing off with of course these broader infrastructures and so or maybe perhaps to speak a bit about the experience of refugees so let me let me ask Rafif to to kind of come in in here. Sure. Um, certainly in, in looking at movements, both the word movements and logistics, I think the, the COVID pandemic itself has really laid bare a lot of these issues around what moves and what doesn't move and what are the hands that move things as well. Um, so the context for, for what we're speaking about is of course a, a global economic apartheid um, where things are produced in certain locations and then move. Uh, most of the time in metropolitan cities like London, we experience the end commodity without knowing where it's come from or the ways in which it has come. The opposite of that, of course, this, you know, fetishizing of getting commodities as quickly as possible, you know, the Amazonization of our everyday life is that people can't move. And we have seen things like border infrastructures um, and surveillance infrastructures move on an international scale. Uh, in a very aggressive way. So when Donald Trump, for example, speaks about his uh, apartheid imagined wall, he will reference the apartheid wall in Israel. Um, those connections are also being being made on a, on a constant basis. So there's, there's this question of what is allowed to move freely and what isn't. Um, and I think in, in building uh, these networks, uh, these mutual aid networks, it's very important to always place that front and center in how we're thinking about it. Um, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit London, there were a lot of mutual aid groups that, that came up. And it was really interesting to see very specific details around what people thought of the police. Um, you know, you had, you had you know, activists who were saying, we don't want to call the police. And on the other hand, these mutual aid groups thought the police is great and let's call them to help out people. So the, these questions come about in quite a different way when we are speaking about mutual aid. Um, and if we do the very local and ignore the larger structures around militarism, of course, and a global system, a system of global economic apartheid, then we're really stuck a little bit in how we function. This is not to say that smaller organizations focusing on the day to day are not doing it properly. Um, it's just a question of we need to keep that bigger picture of the structures that we are facing um, on a very basic level 
um, there was massive police infiltration into some of the activist groups on the environmental side in places like the UK, for example. So policing comes into what we do, whether we like it or not. Surveillance comes into what we do. Um, I would also say in, in looking at these organizations that are grassroots and very local, is to think of where race fits in as well. Um, what groups are able to do what? If you think around how Muslim activists, for example, are racialized in certain contexts, it would be very difficult to organize in the same way that other communities are able to organize. Um, sometimes we have a very totalizing utopian view of the extremely local, but we need to keep race and class and gender um, in that integration into thinking about how we organize at that local level as well. Malik, do you want to come back in here? Because I'm thinking about, to me, sometimes I hear the incommensurability of how to of these situations. So, you know, mutual aid in London or in Minneapolis looks very different than the kind of nexus of, you know, kind of survivability, faith, futurity that you're talking about in African cities or in Jakarta. So I don't know if you want to come back to partially what you were just talking about previously. I mean, in, in part, the, the, the conundrum is, is that wh whatever the, the disposition of the state may be within particular urban regions, it's, it's quite co concretely difficult for the state to, to, to rule and administer, govern over urban regions whose complexions and dispositions of district's life and settlement is, is so heterogeneous. Uh, it's hard to make particular kinds of generalizations about that. I mean, for example, within the past couple of months, some of the more emblematic kinds of settlements that we would consider to be over dense slums and formal settlements that we would, we, that we would think are most vulnerable to extensive viral transmissions have largely circumvented that kind of, uh, that kind of situation. Uh, and how? How is it that some manage to do this and other, others don't? Uh, in some situations, you have such um, uh, an extensive attunement of, of residents to each other. Uh, they know each other so well. They know what each other is doing. They would know how to fulfill their particular occupations and ways of organizing. They could easily substitute for each other. And they do this without deliberation, without a kind of consensus, without a kind of specific discursive means of managing the situation. Other, other districts, this just wouldn't be possible. They're, they're different arrangements. They're, so in, in some ways, the, the specificity of, of ways in which particular urban areas are able to endure are not easily translated to each other. Some are completely captured by particular kinds of extra parliamentary groups. Others are simply left alone to figure out, you know, provisional temporary ways of dealing with things. Others draw upon very long honed institutions that have been developed over decades. All of these within an intensive relation of contiguity to each other. And so when you, when you talk about trying to, to govern an, uh, an urban region of such great heterogeneity, what is, it that, that you, what is it that you do? And only the state is capable of mobilizing the kinds of infrastructural investments, the kinds of resources that are needed in order to do the provisioning at scale that is required. But this, is being, this then has to be grafted onto very particular kinds of situations of settlement and ways of self-management and ways of enduring, which it's not clear how it is going to be translated. So it's a kind of constant kind of tension, a constant kind of attempting to figure out those kinds of, of relationships. 
It's clear that residents cannot survive on their own. And it's also clear that the state cannot impose a kind of univocal overarching regimen of provisioning and governance that is going to have traction within very singular situations. So it's always in this process of, of, of attempting to be, to be to being worked out. And within that kind of challenge, as, as Rafif says, it's important to pay attention to the easy ways in which lives can be categorized as those that don't count or those that count in only a particular way, those that can be dismissed, those that can be revalued. Um, but it is, but it, is a, it is an ongoing kind of process of attempting to work these things out in ways that don't have very clear and obvious solutions. Ruthie, will you come in here? You need to unmute. Yeah. Now I'm here. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy just listening to my co-panelists. I would be happy to sit back and just listen for the rest of our evening together. Uh, but here I'd like to um, step in and, and lift up some of the themes that both Malik and, and Rafif have already raised and see where we might get collectively in talking about them a bit further. So as Malik said earlier, um, when we think about the, the, the residents, the denizens, that's a good word for those of you who don't know it, it's fine, the desidents, de denizens of the various uh, urbanizations of the planet, we're thinking about people wherever they are on the globe. So this isn't just a Southern thing. This is actually, I think, universal, if you'll allow that word. We're thinking about people who are living different and differentiated chronotopes and spatialities. Right? chronotopes, the temporalities of everyday life, which vary even within households, much less within neighborhoods, communities, uh, workplace, industrial sector, and so forth. And that then determines, if it does not define, the spatialities that people live, whether they're long distance migrants or not. So let me give you an example and then go on a bit. Um, New York City, one of the richest cities on the planet, if not the richest, is a place that presents itself to the world and many, in many ways presents itself to itself as a gleaming enclosed playground for the super rich. Well, it's that but it can only be that because of all of the other people who are there. And they're there. They're not outside of New York, although there's been a lot of outward push of, of modestly income people, as well as modestly educated people. But it is full of people who are delivery people, or who are frontline healthcare people, or who are unemployed teachers at all different levels or who are artists, who are you know, all kinds of social and cultural and productive and reproductive workers. So with these different chronotopes and with these different spatialities then, how can we think about what brings people together? And this connects with Rafi's um, points that she made and also the research she has done. And that is, if we think at least roughly about distribution as one of the kind of key significant ways that people come together even if they don't see it and see and touch each other, then we can imagine already some of the big waves of restlessness that I know Angela Davis participated in at the Oakland docks when the uh, international, um, the dock workers, the stevedores, uh, called a one day strike uh, in solidarity with the people who were rising up against racism in general and against the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others in particular. And think then about, for example, how, as Rafif was saying, Amazon 
which really should be a globally publicly owned utility. Global, it should belong to all of us already tonight. Amazon um, it pushes and pulls people and goods, which is to say their stored labor and then their active labor all over the world. And this gives us, again, some sense of how maybe to think of some of the forces and possibilities that articulate the vastness and the vast heterogeneity of settled life and in its uns uh, unsettled um, nature. And that leads me to talk about the other little under half of the people on the planet who aren't living in urban places yet, or who are living at the edge of urban places that aren't fully urbanized in any way that any of us who are overeducated would call urbanized, and to ask ourselves what is happening with them and how are their lives also articulated, which is to say connected, or articulated, which is to say described, uh, spoken of, uh, meaningfully today, and we can see underlying some of the forces that lead to dispossession and push people in some cases, but not all, to urbanization in the form of, for example, land grabs. And given that as a result of this pandemic, all kinds of people in all kinds of places around the planet are going to struggle to get adequate calories because of the interruption of so many of the agricultural productive and distribu distributive forces, make us think very, very hard about who should control what lies beneath and how perhaps the small and local uh, work of mutual aid can be um, augmented and made uh, uh, international in as many ways as possible. So not just through slogans or through analogy, but through the actual understanding and following of these trails of production, reproduction, consumption, social reproduction. Okay, so can I, can I just make a kind of follow-up to, to your answers to the last questions, we'll soon be able to take some, some questions from the, from the audience. Um, and I just want to, it's basically, if you like, a kind of theory practice question. Because on the one hand, I'm really interested in how each of you think, well, what you think about the sort of theories that are circulating now around the movement or how you would, if, if you would like to put a name on the theoretical framework that, um, that you think is most appropriate for, for capturing the conjuncture. I mean, we have some choices that are circulating now, anti-blackness, racial capitalism, settler colonialism, Rafif made an earlier point about occupation versus settler colonialism, so on. So on the one hand that, and at the same time to kind of push a little bit on how these very, in some ways, complicated ideas that you've all been describing and sort of creating a vocabulary for how to describe and talk about what is existing now, how that translates into political movements, I mean, mobilization. I mean, partially it's an organizing question, but partially it's a translation question too. So if I could just sort of relay that question back to you, um, and I'll just, whoever would like to, to jump in to answer, please do. Okay, all of you are now going shy, <laughs> smiling with your mute buttons on. Someone must lift the mute button and speak <laughs> or say, we don't want to answer that question. <gasps> no? I, I can speak to the settler colonialism point. Um, okay. Because I, th I think 
it's almost stated some sometimes nowadays like settler colonialism has, has made a comeback when it comes to Palestine um, when in reality it's been for decades now that many Palestinians have very accurately described um, the, the our situation and our condition under Israeli settler colonialism as settler colonialism um, and this this goes to speak uh, to to voice and whose voice and whose analysis matters uh, a lot of the time that it things are imagined as a new discovery when the people who've actually been facing the settler colonialism have been saying it for quite some time. Um, I think though the shift is a really welcome one um, because it, it reframes the situation much more accurately. My worry is when these framings become all totalizing and take away any nuance of the societies that they are describing. So alongside Israeli settler colonialism, it came the Oslo or so-called Oslo peace process, which really shifted around the way um, Palestinians themselves treated the issue of Palestine. The declaration itself was the declaration on the two-state solution. The right of return was put on a back burner. But it, eventually what the Oslo process did, um, it wasn't simply a process of you know, a military one, but also an economic one that created uh, an elite within Palestinian society, an elite that has quite a separate and different vision of what Palestinian liberation might mean. So it's very important in using the terminology of settler colonialism to, to very accurately still look at the society and what has happened, the phases of settler colonialism, how it changes the dynamics of the, the places in which it's, it's being implemented. Um, everyone loves quoting Fanon. Um, people tend to forget about his chapter on the pitfalls of nationalism. And I think that's quite a relevant one to always keep in mind and keep going back to uh, in terms of, of understanding these situations of settler colonialism and the creation of these bourgeoisies, let's call them what they are. I also worry about the extremely sharp demarcation that then happens between settler colonialism and colonialism. And I know in terms of social science typologies, um, that's how they function. They function in putting things in boxes. But history does not tend to work in boxes. So colonialism and settler colonialism um, emerge together. There's a lot of learning that happens across empire from the colonies to the settler colonies. Uh, basic things that we know of today and take for granted, like processes of fingerprinting, um, started in the colonies and made their way back um, and then internationalized. So I think this demarcation between settler colonialism and colonialism sometimes makes us not see these interconnections. And as we're speaking about policing in particular, uh, and the way incarceration works as well, and, and prison systems, this kind of travel and circulation of these ideas across empire, um, you know, sometimes to a lot of people, these things start with the war on terror, but there's actually a much longer history that we need to reckon with. Um, and as somebody who is, you know, a, a survivor of a settler colony, but living in the heart of empire that created that settler colony, it's really remarkable the lack of historical reckoning with empire and histories of settler colonialism. Um, if you go to Buckingham Palace, there's actually three, three roads leading out in the direction of Canada, the Dominions, Canada and Australia, and this is still celebrated to this day. So all, all the talk about decolonization, I think, needs to go much more deeply. Um, and I would say decolonization is another one of those theoretical words that is coming about. Um, and it would be great to have a conversation about that one as well with the, my co-panelists. Anyone else want to comment to this? You don't have to. I now have a whole bunch of questions from the audience, but if you... Let, let, me, just, let me just say something br briefly. Uh, in, in Islam, there is a, a notion called uh, Bilad al-Sibba, uh, which basically refers to the, the land of the unsettled, the land of the unconnected, the land of the unaddressable. And within Islam, um, it is a kind of ironic position because it points to the insufficiency of Islam as a kind of overarching 
mode of articulation that can forge together interrelationships between the various manifestations of Muslims. And what is needed then are invented forms of brokerage and mediation and negotiation. You begin to suture together those kinds of ties as a way to try to create something that's overarching. And I take note of, 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 of what Ruthie was saying before as a kind of frame of articulating the disparate, the, the, the multiple. But I also think that there is something that is useful in repurposing notions of logistics, notions of everyday practices of brokerage, all of the kinds of things that we tend to somehow disparage in terms of our political imaginaries as a way of thinking, how do you put different kinds of initiatives and mobilizations in touch with each other within a context where it is not clear just how settlements, political settlements are to be, are to be made, uh, where, you, where you have to assume that there is nothing at the moment that is able to automatically connect the disparate and rather to pay attention to the different kinds of practices that could be deployed, trying to work out frameworks of mutual translation, of connection, of suturing. Um, and I think that we need to be able to repurpose discourses and, and techniques and tools that oftentimes we shy away from uh, in order to experiment with these kinds of uh, formations. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, Ruthie, can I, do you want to say something to this? I was going to I move. Do. Go ahead no, then. I really, I want, to, I want to speak exactly to what Malik was saying. I came here to talk to him and Rafif. So, um, exactly, exactly. And these are, it seems to me that the two ways we have to think all the time are in, in terms of, you know, the big articulations that, that pull us all together and in the fact that on the ground, what people do has so much variety and so much particularity and can and cannot sometimes connect together. This is what abolition is all about. This and nothing else, really. It is about figuring out how people make small things or particular things or even things that reproduce a bit over space but don't uh, extend that far um, into ways in which lives can flourish and be voluptuous and quite beautiful. And I don't mean middle class suburban United States, you know, that ridiculous idea of abolition that's been circulating lately. Um, that, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a small group of people from dotted around the planet who have been trying to write and we're almost done an international abolitionist statement. And the purpose of the statement is to invite people to think about what they already know and what they already do in the context of some of the structural, global, um, distributive, militarized, uh, imperialized problems that we've all laid out. The point of the statement and the point of abolition is to stop being a culture of complaint and be a culture that lifts up and figures out with people what people do to change the world or even just to get along in the world without necessarily having an, an idea to change it. So, you know, the, the, the way that some people use, you know, one of the theories that you uh, named, Avery, racial capitalism, makes me crazy because they seem to think that capitalism became racial one day when slavery started, as against capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. So there can never be good capitalism. Like never, it's not possible. And thinking about the articulations or the co-constitutive uh, interdependencies of organized abandonment and organized violence give us ways to to address what is going on by paying attention to what people already do. And, and that to me is the heart of the struggle, whether we're talking about mutual aid 
in Chicago or the kinds of practices that Malik described or what I've learned from one of my colleagues is happening in Kerala and so on, that, that there is an internationalism that matters. It doesn't have a single shape to it, but turning away from capitalism is an imperative that I can't shake off. Thanks, Ruthie. Um, okay, so I now have a list of some questions from the audience that um, that I would like to um, share. So there are quite a few of them, and I think maybe Ruthie will just continue on with you because one of the questions here is specifically addressed to you, and it asks what could be the spatial dimensions of black, what would the spatial dimensions of black futurity look like in the wake of dismantling racial capitalism? And so I don't know if you want to take up that question, but it seems to follow on from what you were just talking about. Well, I don't mean to harsh anybody's mellow, but I thought I was just talking about futurity. Um, rather than black futurity. Um, and yet, because of how I was formed in this world, uh, I actually do believe that in some cases, when black people live better, when black lives matter, everybody lives better. Um, uh, black futurity is something that we see on the ground in the kind of work that Abdul Malik and, Ed, and Edgar Petersey have written about so extensively. Um, futurity is what we see when we see the particular kinds of experiments that people have put into place by way of the MST in Brazil and beyond the various people who have been doing work that sometimes comes under the aegis of Via Campesina for all of the criticisms that, that many may have is all about having some future sense of relationship to land. And there's also a central contradiction that is not going to go away. And that is the central contradiction of on the one hand, something we call self-determination and on the other hand, the, the contradiction that re requires that we undo borders and all of the kind of work that the forces of organized violence keep uh, in shape in order for organized abandonment to happen. So can we have self-determination and open borders? That's a contradiction, but it's one that we just live out through the kinds of practices that Rafif and Malik are talking about, rather than we say, this is what it will look like, now let us put this plan into being. So that is my answer to that question. Thanks, Ruthie. Um, there are two questions here for Malik, and Malik, if it's okay, I'll just give them to you together, and they seem to me somewhat related, and then you can see how you want to answer them. And th the first one reads, in the context of Indian migrant workers, I appreciated your invocation of thinking otherwise about the walking away. In the context of life and death, expropriation of labor within Indian neoliberalism, do you think these walking aways are in between abandonment and newer forms of living? So that's, that's one question. And the second one, is asking a similar question. It says, what you're talking about as abandoning, it seems to me that in different contexts, Albert Hirschman and Paolo Verno have called exit. With Hirschman in particular, two other terms are important, voice and loyalty. Exit or voice become the response depending on the level of loyalty. What you are suggesting seems to be another step where exit and voice occur together. Uh, 
it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating question, actually. It's, uh, um, I, 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 at the spur of the moment, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to, to, to address it. Um, in, in, in terms of the, of the, the migrants walking away, um, uh, my, my, my good friend and colleague, Anant Marangati at uh, Hyderabad Urban Lab, who has worked a lot with um, migrants in the, in the past months, uh, does talk about it as the, the, the need to, to leave and to think through what the next step is going to be. Um, so a space of, of contemplation, a space of strategic anticipation. Um, so there is a kind of, it is a kind of interstitial uh, moment, particularly after making long journeys, uh, the position of home in so-called rural areas oftentimes uh, refuses to incorporate them or incorporates them war warily. Um, so in, in, in a very concrete way, it's a kind of inter interstitial moment. Um, in terms of the other 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 question is is it it is it has for me it has something to do with the way in which um, in which value is increasingly calculated um, where where value is something that continuously shifts uh, dependent upon the kinds of computations that are applied. So that valuation is no longer sufficient in terms of how you consolidate a particular kind of position or a standpoint. Rather, it's your ability to become different things to different people in different locations at different times. It's almost the conversion of the self into a kind of logistical, logistical instrument. Um, so in some ways, it is the, the movement that I'm talking about is a way in which you try to keep up with the shifting terrain of how one's life is valued, uh, which doesn't, which means that a kind of investment in a particular kind of version of yourself doesn't really make all of that much sense. But it's also a way to try to circumvent that very game at the same time, uh, to try to operate outside of some kind of scrutiny even as the, the, the methods and the, the, the technologies of surveillance and tracking are all the more proficient so that you never really can operate outside, but you attempt to try to circumvent that, that, that ver very game. Um, and so it's a kind of double-edged sword. At the, at the, uh, on the one hand, it's reflective of what is necessary as a kind of self in motion which is in some ways the kind of version of contemporary forms of, of, of valuation. But at the same time, it's a way to, it's simply a way of, of abandoning, of trying to abandon either positions of being abandoned or walking away from the need to have to deliver to whatever kind of scrutiny is existent, a particular version of yourself that makes sense and to try to operate and, and try to stop making sense, as talking heads used to say, um, as, as a way in which to try to uh, I inhabit uh, ur ur urban conditions. Thank you. Um, okay, so this, this is a question that is not directed to, to a specific person, and so you all might wish to speak to it, and it, it reads as follows. The Guianized writer Wilson Harris calls for a, quote, literacy of the imagination that is a reschooling of society to meet the challenges posed by global and cognitive capitalism, and for a, quote, consuming of our biases to generate cross-cultural and interracial, transgendered, and radical feminist communities would the panelists comment on the uses of such an approach to the project of racial justice, nonviolence by the state, and economic parity? This might be an opportunity to go 
back to the point that Rafif made in the beginning about um, the assault um, on a radical imaginary and to um, come back come back to that point as well. Um, who, Rafif, would you? Sure, I'll, I'll say something to that. Um, so I've, I've worked on this book for quite some time now, the, the one that Avery mentioned at the beginning, and actually both Avery and Ruthie are interviewed in the book. So um, if, if you want to read more of them, get the book. But to say what we were trying to do in the book was, was look at forms of organizing that already exist and, and thought and organizing and histories of struggle that are there but we are rarely taught about them because universities from day one push you to say uh, you have to discover something absolutely new. Uh, it should be your own novel idea that somehow popped into your head on its own when we all know that ideas come from somewhere. And when it comes to movements in particular, um, there, there are histories of struggle there. There are histories of, of survival and struggle and praxis and an archive of resistance. Um, so some of the incredible work that Avery has done, for example, in being a keeper of those kinds of archives is really remarkable. So when we're thinking through this moment of building on, on praxis, I think we have to start with acknowledging that we stand on the shoulders of a lot of incredible people that have done this work. Um, although you quite often will never find them in our curricula, uh, we won't be reading them in our syllabi, but this, this work and this archive of resistance is there. And I think in this moment, as we think about the future and what we're trying to build, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't assume this utter newness. Um, I know that in the heat of movements, we're always like, we're the first ones to ever do this. We're the cutting edge radicals. Uh, but, but there is an archive that is there for us. And it includes a lot of mistakes. And that's useful too. It's as useful to look at the past mistakes and those repertoires of resistance that we have. And, and certainly I think anything coming into the future because of all this work that has been done is going to be anti-racist, um, is not going to be transphobic, um, is, is going to imagine a world that's different. And what is for me particularly important about this moment is the long-term work that has happened around abolition um, because the, whatever movement is also going to have to be abolitionist. That's no longer uh, out of the box or something we cannot consider. It's there, it's at the center, um, and it's, it's time to engage with it in a much more systematic, analytical way. And that's starting to happen. Um, one thing I would say is not to get frustrated with people too quickly. Um, because, you know, learning does not happen overnight and it's not a spontaneous thing that comes about. It's a process and sometimes it's, it's difficult, um, but it, it needs to happen if we are aiming to build those kinds of movements. So I, I agree with everything that was put in the question. Um, I just want to always remind us that things don't start at point zero. We are standing on the shoulders of long traditions and that should give us a lot of strength. Um, speaking of settler colonialism, one of the main things that I've learned working with indigenous communities in Canada and the US is to always cherish the memories of our ancestors that because of their remembering, we are still here and we still remember. So that's a strength. Um, there's a line by Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish that says, your, your dead and your injured are ammunition within you. Keep them, that's how you will move forward. Um, and that's, I think, something really helpful in how we think of our movements. Thank you, Rafif. Ruthie, Malik, do you wish to speak to this question? Sure. Um, I, think, I think it's a great question. And uh, my one caution about how it can be misunderstood, and I think I'm, I'm building on what what Rafi has just said, is um, the notion that there is a, um, some kind of literacy that some consultants can put together or that an introductory course at the university will cover and then will be done. So everybody will know something about something. Uh, and as somebody who was assigned to teach uh, such courses, 
for many, 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 many years of my career. I have to tell you, I hated it. I hated it. I loved what I taught about. And I always had 40 students out of 250 who had some interest in what I was doing uh, in the classroom. And those students tended to be artists, athletes, and engineers. Those were, they were the most engaged in, in learning this thing that Wilson Harris might call um, literacy. And everybody else was just resentful because what they thought they heard in spite of what I actually said for 15 weeks was, white people are bad, black people are oppressed, take a test, right? So we have a problem in how we go about doing this work. And I hope that my colleagues will figure out how to do the work so that the work, for example, of the university doesn't become one in which we add a little bit of uh, sensitivity uh, to an unchanged curriculum, but rather to go back to the point that I think Rafif was making and to go to what I have learned from reading Malik's work and being in rooms with him and Zooms with him over the few years we've known each other is starting somewhere else and thinking about the pedagogical uh, work that we do in terms of building consciousness, not in terms of adding content to people's uh, knowledge or lives. Um, and, and maybe one last thing I'll say right now is that we've been talking about infrastructures and, and, and you know, roads and connections and what is lacking and so forth. And, and I've been thinking a long time about something that is uh, immaterial and yet absolutely real, or maybe it's material, but we can't necessarily touch it. And that's the infrastructure of feeling, which is what we kind of rest on that underlies the possibility of us being uh, socially and politically and radically productive in this world. And I don't mean productive for the measurement of jobs or anything. I mean, doing things together. And it's kind of the infrastructure of feeling that I think underlies the kinds of examples that Malik has given and the examples that Rafi, Rafif has given. And the examples I think that our colleagues um, offered in the earlier iteration of this UCHRI series. Thanks, Ruthie. Malik, do you want to add anything here? Okay. Um, okay, so we have about we have about 13 minutes left. And if it's all right with you, I would give you one more question. Um, and then we can um, you can make any final comments that that you would like. And I'm sorry, I won't be able to get to all the questions that people sent, but I would, I think, choose this one as the last one. And this question is, could the panelists discuss the connection, connections between the movements for Black Lives as a shorthand for the broader movements under discussion today and the issues of exclusions, mobilities, and injustices related to climate change? Is there one of you who would like to take up that question? No? Um, okay. Um, would you like Sorry, it the, different? The, the, the not speaking is not because it's not a very important question. It, it is, um, it, it's just that for me, climate change is at the center of everything we've been speaking about in terms of what's pushing people to move in a lot of situations um how movement is working the, the question of climate change is right at the center of it uh, maybe we didn't mention it like by word um just because i'm not an environmental scientist that can say very wise things about it but from the limited non-scientific knowledge i have i don't think we could speak of 
movement, circulation, uh, and the way our societies function today, racial capitalism and how it's structured without putting the question of the environment and climate change right at the center of this discussion. It's partially your response, Rafif, you know, raises the question about the, um, if you like, sort of what's, what's assumed and what isn't assumed in, um, in movements and the political intelligence, if you like, that movements harbor and, and spread about. But Ruthie is unmuted. So Ruthie, would you? I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 I, I was. I wanted to, to lift up the point that, that Rafif made and, and emphasize it. Um, I don't know, maybe an hour ago, I used the word green, which is supposed to be mean climate change. <laughs> it's supposed to mean environment. It's supposed to mean we are water beings on the water planet. It means that for the many long distance migrants who, for example, in India, have walked or taken the train when the trains were still running or taken buses or ridden in the back of lorries home, how have they gotten there? And then what is happening there? So, I mean, here's an example of, of the kinds of um, uh, struggles that people face as um, uh, they're doing everything else they're doing to have a home, to do that fundamental, simple human thing to make a home, the home, that, that basic, basic thing that is so hard for so many people. And that is, uh, for example, in India, there's been a, um, there was for many years, a, a policy that uh, guaranteed to every household something like 100 hours per year, so not a lot of hours, of paid labor at prevailing minimum wage working on public works. So it was a way to bring money into the household, money, cash money, um, and allegedly uh, created new relations of power and difference based in gender and households because some of the jobs were reserved for women, blah, 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 blah. The point I'm getting to is what kinds of public works did people build during this period of guaranteed work? Did they build waterworks, which would mean that people who walked all the way home when the pandemic started might have water available to use in the soil to grow food? Or did they build roads that might have made it possible for people to get home more quickly, but also means that the roads are to bring food from somewhere else rather than to make it possible to develop the food at home? And this raises questions about the state under climate change, it raises questions about all kinds of things. And my point is simply that if abolition is to be, it has to be green. If it's going to be green, then it has to be, I don't know what the color is, but I'm using the old fashioned color red. And if it's red, then it has to be international. I mean, those are, I think, givens, but all of those things will only happen when and as people rehearse in their lives what that actually means, not when people like me or anybody recites here or anywhere, you know, certain key words, key terms, key outrages, or key desires, that it's all a matter of rehearsal. And I'm excited whenever I talk to Rafif and whenever I talk to Malik, because I'm feeling the rehearsals that people have done over time and across space in these different temporalities, creating and recreating the space that we live in. Thank you, Ruthie. Um, we've only got about, we've got about mm, six, seven minutes left. And so I think it would be um, appropriate maybe for each of you to just make any final remarks that you would like to make. So we sort of, return to the rubric under which we were invited to, to convene, um, race at the boiling point, um, movement, our, our key word, our key theme, and to ask if each of you might want to just say a final word. It can be your last thought. It can be something that wasn't covered that you want to make sure gets 
put on the table as you wish. Malik, should we start with you? No, just to, to, to follow, maybe to follow up on the, on the last the last comments. I mean, one one continuously has to ask, how is it possible that like voluminous amounts of concrete and steel can be applied to urban regions where for the majority of urban residents, particularly under lockdown, the insides of their living quarters were 53, 54 degrees. The outside streets were flooded. Um, it was impossible to go anywhere. It was impossible to stay anywhere, yet uh, an inordinate amount of building continues to take place, uh, funded by you know, major hedge funds and investment companies, and without any kind of consideration to the real conditions of everyday, li every, everyday life. And so, as my, as my colleague Neferti Tariar would, would ask, under what situations is it possible to recuperate a life worth living? And, 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 and how is a sense of value uh, re-pieced together within these kinds of conditions of complete disconsonance between the way in which um, many urban, urban regions continue to be built and the way in which they are, they are actually, actually lived. And to pay attention, as Ruthie has said on, on, on many, many occasions, about frameworks that are possible to enable the kind of very experimental nature of that attempt to recuperate some kind of value uh, in a way in which people can find a way to understand each other and to translate their their fraught provisional experiments to try to recuperate an existence that is worth living uh, in ways that are oftentimes we, 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 we don't yet have a ready vernacular to, to understand, but to be able to continue to engage those, those efforts and to find ways to support them. Thank you. Ruthie, Rafif, final comments? Um, I'm happy to go. Um, I'll, I'll leave Ruthie the last word. Uh, I think for me, speaking from the vantage point of, of the Middle East, I think the region has been under the assault of the twinning of neoliberalism and authoritarianism for quite some time, which has resulted in very heavy securitization modes of policing and militarism. But the doctrines that have been practiced in the region have circulated and reverberated on an international scale, um, whether they are the techniques of torture or the equipment or um, even the language that is used, an entire industry around Islamophobia, for example, that has reverberated um, from the Middle East to the rest of the world. And I think looking at that circulation is really important for how we, um, how we analyze the current moment. Sometimes in our very local geographies, we could miss those wider circulatory networks of coercive measures. But on the other hand, what has also circulated are ideas um, that are radical and, and different. Um, so there are reading circles around abolition right now happening under occupation in Palestine, which is quite remarkable. Um, and, and those connections across our movements have, have always existed, have historically existed. I think uh, Robin Kelly recently said, we shouldn't think of solidarity as a transaction. You give me a little and I give you a little. And unfortunately, that's how the new mode of operation works. But I think in this moment of reimagining things, we need to get out of these boxes as well. Um, and as I was saying right at the beginning, beyond just the analogies into the analysis that Ruthie was speaking about, thinking of what actually connects us and what we can do together. Um, recently, uh, the Israeli government has put out a tender, for example, trying to sell its equipment internationally, seeing what's happening beyond COVID, looking at the economic downturn that is very likely to hit us soon. Um, they're talking about surveillance equipment, uh, various types of facial recognition equipment. So on that level, there is thinking happening on an international scale of how coercion should work. So I think we also need to think 
in an internationalist way. Um, and just as a final note, Ruthie said um, she'll keep with the traditional red. I'm happy with that. Green red sounds good to me. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Rafi. Ruthie? Thank you. Let's, we're sticking with the red. A um, couple of things, uh, very local, very global. Uh, I started with a story about prisons and I want to end with prisons, uh, end with a call for everybody who has the authority to release people from prisons, to release them from prisons, which every single one is a Petri dish uh, creating uh, the conditions for people to suffer from COVID and from other debilitating um, illnesses, mental and physical. And um, to tell you that that very part of the security housing unit where that Aryan Brotherhood guy thought he saw Angela Davis and Mumia Abu-Jamal is the place where after a series of hunger strikes in part inspired by the uprising in North Africa and West Asia, uh, that happened earlier in, in, in this century, um, a uh, group of people representing all of the quote unquote races in that prison called for an end to the hostility among the races as the only way they could see that they could ever get out of that death house. Globally, um, we can see that one of the key engines of a certain amount of pension fuel land grabs is being done by TIAA CREF, which is the pension fund that people like me and Avery, well, maybe not because you're at University of California, but many people who teach in uh, North America and beyond have had their deferred compensation put into so that when we get to old age, I'm 70, we can draw that money out. TIAA CREF is leading the planet in land grabbing for the purposes of funding pension payments to retired professors, school teachers, not-for-profit workers in the global north. These are issues that people can and should address people out of prison interrupt the ways that um, enormous uh, uh, managers of enormous amounts of money, whether their hedge funds or pension funds, are reinforcing the very kind of organized abandonment and depending therefore on the organized violence that the red, green, and international of abolition seeks to undo. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you, Rafif. Thank you, Malik. And also, I want to thank uh, David Goldberg again and the UCHRI for organizing these conversations and for everyone who's been watching and listening. So thank you all. Uh, this has been a super, super interesting and engaged conversation. I think those out there listening in uh, will agree. Uh, that in bringing um, to a kind of aliveness a notion of movement as a vector of social life and being uh, of histories of making and unmaking movements across space and time, uh, across land and of course sea, between and against and behalf of ideas, of people, of societies. Indeed, as Ruthie encouraged us, at the close uh, of making, moving to make better lives together. I'm tempted to leave by saying, uh, keep moving in that spirit. Uh, I want to thank, add my voice of thanks to Avery, to Avery and to all the panelists, Ruthie, uh, Malik and Rafif, uh, really extraordinary conversation uh, and to both interpreters who've been with us. Uh, we look forward to August 7th, when we'll be hosting another of these events on truth, uh, manufacturing, meaning, uh, and fabrication uh, through culture. Uh, I look forward to seeing you then. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll let you know. And keep well, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks so much.